you don't necessarily have to sit so far away. If you if you did feel like you wanted to come a little closer, that would be that would be absolutely fine. Um, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's fine. Little little half-hearted, but fine. <laughs> oh, you, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you. I think the thing with this is is the proportion of time you're looking at me relative to looking at the screen, just putting yourself in a position where you can see both and engage with both as much as you can. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Um, yeah. I have a recurring image of a room. The room is white. It has no doors or windows. It has no connection with the outside world. It would seem that there is no way into or out of the room, but the room has always been there. It is a safe, sterile environment a vacuum. Somehow, I find myself inside this room. I do not know how I got inside, but I sense that whatever led to this state of affairs was not against my will. I think I wanted to come here to allow a way of thinking or a way of being to internally evolve, independent of external stimulation with no awareness of anything beyond this room. Now, despite there being no windows, there is light in this room, but strangely, no indication of a source for this illumination. I wait. I wait for some kind of perceptual structure to unfold according to a set code or pattern that, like the room itself, has always been there. In such an environment, one's conception of time would perhaps become shaky. It's hard to imagine how long it would take before the clarity of memories of a life before entering this room would diminish. But in my image of this room, we reach a certain point where all there is, is this. Where all there ever has been is this room. I wait. I wait for the emergence of pure ideas, ranging from the fully formed to merely abstract notions. But the conception of what an idea actually is, regardless of its content, comes from the outside. Similarly, the conception of being outside, as opposed to inside, makes no sense if this is all there is. I wait. I consider the idea of forgetting and remembering being the same thing, in that to forget something, that something must still be evoked and hence remembered. And of course, the current state of affairs of finding myself in this room represents experience that will inevitably transform into a memory to be disposed of. I have often imagined and extrapolated a nightmarish scenario of total documentation. Of every waking experience having some form of recorded double. This fear would be pathological, imagined as a state of affairs that I myself would have compulsively instigated. 
that having taken all the pictures of all the things I had ever seen and done in my life and recorded all the sounds I had ever made and heard from birth to present, or at least from the age of my acquisition of technological aptitude, I would wonder if I had been complicit in a violation of the diktats of proper particular space and proper particular time. Within the framework of this thought experiment, one may be haunted by the idea that the capturing of an image or a sound is to contribute to that creeping sense of collective societal discombobulation regarding the where and when of things. I wonder what would happen if I stopped recording. Would this usher in a new sense of orientation? But somehow, the thought process didn't stop there. It started to occur to me that it is all materials that are displaced, recorded or not, that all forms are adulterated in the wrong place at the wrong time in an increasingly unnatural order. In this image of the world, everything is out of its place. Everything is out of its time. Therefore, returning all materials to a place of origin becomes an imperative. This return also implies a breaking down of constituent parts. Now, a phrase such as breaking down perhaps takes us into a realm of destructive behavior. You may have a breaking down of things materially, of things being methodically taken apart and returned to a prior form. Not to start again necessarily, just to get closer to the beginning. Then we have a breaking down of things psychologically speaking. This would be the desire for a cleansing of the sensory palate, returning to a place where language has been de-learned and all experience forgotten. Picture your body growing backwards to the eventual point of finding oneself lying in a cot, perpetually staring at a white, featureless ceiling with no way to articulate what this empty frame might mean. I recall similarly regressive imagery in a particular passage from Kurt Vonnegut's 1969 novel, Slaughterhouse-Five. In this instance, the nature of time is explored in reverse. Throughout this book, the main protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, keeps on becoming unstuck in time, drifting involuntarily between past, present, and future. There is one section of the book where he is watching a movie set during World War II. But in his unstuck state, Billy sees the movie backwards as he moves backwards in time. He sees a formation of US bombers flying backwards over a German city in flames. Quote, the bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which shrunk the fires, gathered them in cylindrical steel containers, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. End quote. Billy goes on to describe the miraculous devices possessed by the German soldiers on the ground that suck bullets from the bodies of the US airmen. As the film continues to play out in reverse, bodies are steadily repaired and the damaged planes are gradually reconstructed as they fly over Germany and back to their bases. The bombs and bullets are then taken from the planes to factories where they are diffused, broken down to their constituent elements and put back into the ground, out of harm's way. Billy imagines how the soldiers will one day become children. So what I've described there is a simple inversion of effect and cause. And of course, time travel backwards and forwards is a recurring theme in literary and cinematic manifestations of the science fiction genre. Inciting Derek Parfit's philosophical tract, Reasons and Persons, 
author and cognitive scientist Douglas Hofstadter states that, quote, well-told stories pluck powerful chords, end quote. Hofstadter tells me Parfit's story of a man who used a teleportation machine, and now you'll hear a version of it condensed by me. In this story, by now third or even fourth hand, the story exists in two versions with very different outcomes and implications. So in the first version, upon entering the machine, the man will have his body molecularly destroyed in the current space and time as a means of having it subsequently reassembled in another space and time. This is experienced with a momentary lapse in consciousness with one awaking in a different place moments later. The second version of the story goes something like this. There is now a different kind of teleportation machine that rather than destroying the body for reconstruction elsewhere, the machine merely reads the body and creates an additional copy of the body in another place and time, this time without the destruction of the original. The second version of the story goes something like this. There is now a different kind of teleportation machine that rather than destroying the body for reconstruction elsewhere, the machine merely reads the body and creates an additional copy of the body in another place and time. This time, without the destruction of the original. Both stories are unnerving, but in very different ways. We either have the original body destroyed and replaced by another original, or the notion of there being two identical and conscious bodies in two places at once. In the latter example, we could think of this in terms of being a twin through becoming rather than birth. And no doubt somewhere, you may have a double of yourself in the form of a videotape taken many years ago at a family gathering, perhaps, or a school play you were performing in. You may look back at this footage, and such may be the strength of its evocation that just to watch it is to experience something akin to a form of time travel. This may be a video that evokes so strongly a sense of another time and space that it's almost as if you had been transported back there. But such notions remain in the realm of hyperbole with real time travel discussed in terms of fictional premise or scientific impossibility. Now in the early days of video, the necessary equipment, camera, record, a monitor, and microphone were separate components that had to be uh, hooked up properly to work. However, the JVC GRC1, first manufactured in 1984, was one of the first domestic video cameras to function as an all-in-one unit. In dispensing of a separate tape deck, its design was instrumental in ushering in the era of the portable camcorder, with its use of the compact VHS-C tape, a fraction of the size of the standard VHS cassette. Now, this was a process that began in 2012, an activity that led me to spend a great deal of time bidding for a series of obsolete video cameras for heavily depreciated prices in online auctions. Obsolescence in this case would be characterized by the age of equipment, the oldest video camera here that I purchased being over 40 years in age. So in biblical terms, these cameras represent an old testament of video. But in the context of eBay, where most of these cameras were sourced, this fact was supposedly a contemporary selling point to those of us of a certain age. 
The attachment of the term vintage or retro to auction descriptions was the bait. In this case, the JVC GRC1 is frequently described in eBay listings as the back to the future camera, with sellers citing its central role in the 1985 Robert Zemeckis film as a primary selling point. Now, I hardly need remind you of the finer details of the plot of Back to the Future. The usual potential temporal paradoxes abound, from the near catastrophic meeting with one's own double to the clear and present danger of inadvertent incest. In watching the film as a child, I remember this led to the first instances of my daydreaming of my body being in two places at once in actuality, rather than through some employment of video trickery. But this recollection is also to reiterate the use of the JVC GRC1 in several key scenes depicting Doc Brown's time travel experiments. The following story exists in two versions with very different outcomes and implications. The first version suggests that I'm about to show you some of the only footage that exists of my family dog. Now, this is the dog I had as a child. Frankie, the dog. I'm told this footage was shot by my father during a day out to the beach in the summer of 1986 using a JVC GRC1. Recalling the earlier observation of how well-told stories may pluck powerful chords, one might accompany these images with a poignant story of the absence of a pet animal that has long since passed. How one may remember the day that this footage was taken, perhaps not too long before the death of this loved animal how he had very human eyes. How my brother and I would imagine that if we search through the fur on our dog's belly, we would find a small metallic zip forming a line from the midst of his broad chest to his genitalia. And in tugging on the zip, we would picture how the dog's outer fur could be peeled off, revealing that inside the body of our dog was the body of a small man. A naked man who had been living inside this dog's body. A man masquerading as a dog. Now, the only clue would be the eyes. He had very human eyes. The second version of the story goes something like this. My family rarely took photographs, um, and we certainly never had a video camera. Even now, looking through the few albums that do exist, I've always had a sense that I'm subject to some form of manufactured familial conspiracy of faked staged photographs inhabited by actors paid by the hour to smile. Obscure aunts and distant uncles become fictional constructs. So in simpler terms, this is how a well-told story may not be the entire story. The second set of images you see show the author of this text on an unnamed beach holding a JVC GRC1 video camera, pointing it at what appears to be the same animal as in the earlier stills.
The camera used to generate these images was this camera, a Sony HVR A1E, a high definition camera released in 2007, giving the images a sharpness and clarity lacking from the first set. So this would either suggest a time frame of filming at a point of post obsolescence for the JVC GRC1, or the possibility that there are two dogs in this story. I suppose the thesis is that the sense of another time or place is not dictated by the content of the footage. Point as such as a location that has not been visited in recent memory or clear visual evidence of one's own aging. More poignantly, we may be drawn to the images of people or animals who were there and question as to whether they are still here or there. However, what primarily interests me is what the tone of the image might suggest. The association of a particular kind of warmth, sharpness, or softness associated with a particular video camera or tape format. So there is a particular space and a particular time, but I want to highlight a third dimension, this being a particular recording device and a particular format combining as a vessel to carry the signal. Now in this scene from Back to the Future, Einstein the dog is about to be sent two minutes into the future in an experiment conducted by Doc Brown, documented by, I don't have to say it again, a JVC GRC1 operated by Marty McFly. In watching the scene in the contemporary context, I wonder to what degree this dog, or any dog, would have the capacity to perceive a two minute shift in space and time. John Bradshaw's writings on canine perception of time show how dogs' short-term memory has been investigated experimentally using a method called visual displacement. How long can a dog remember where something has disappeared from? In such tests, a dog sees a favourite toy hidden behind one of four identical boxes. Next, a screen is placed in front of the boxes after the toy has been hidden. So the dog has to remember which box the toy is hidden behind. Once the screen is removed, the dog has to rely on memory recall to find the toy. In terms of time, experiments show that just a 30 second delay is enough to induce mistakes. After one minute, even more mistakes are made. In terms of space, dogs seem better at remembering where things had disappeared to relative to an internal sense of their own positions rather than external landmarks. Bradshaw concludes that dogs' short-term memories of individual events are fallible because, quote, they are much more interested in working out precisely what people want them to do here and now than in recalling precisely what happened a few minutes ago, end quote. This perceptual framework reflects the kind of documentation I have started to find much more interesting. That which pertains to recent memory, perhaps only a few minutes later than an event, rather than years having passed since that thing you hadn't experienced in its original form anyway. I now found myself imagining a performance designed for an audience of dogs, being documented by a recording device that will only record in two minute sections before immediately and constantly recording over what has just been seen. Both camera and canine in a near constant state of amnesia. Now, as a point of entry, um, into an exploration of the next camera, the Sony AV3400 Portapack, I'd like to begin by citing Michael Powell's 1960 film, Peeping Tom, the story of a young camera assistant obsessed by fear and the desire to capture it on celluloid. This compulsion leads him to murder women and to record their fear at the moment of their death. 
The screen remains dark for a moment. In the darkness, we hear the film's theme music, a gentle whirring, purring noise. Fade in a long shot of a solitary figure of a woman standing professionally alone at the end of a street. As we approach, she hesitates for a moment, weighs us up carefully, and then, half defiantly, half expecting to be laughed at, she announces her price. Could be two quid. Evidently, we have two quid. She juts her head towards the right and sets off. The camera follows at a respectful distance. She unlocks the door of her room and goes inside. She steps back from the camera, but the camera won't have it. Suddenly, she is staring at something of great curiosity. It turns quickly to bewilderment, and then the bewilderment to fear. She is now staring at something in horror. Fade in title. Over its duration, the film incrementally discloses the gruesome nature of these murders. The peeping Tom walks slowly towards his prey, a blade concealed and then revealed from the foot of the tripod that he no doubt plunges into the victim's neck. Of course, working with good old-fashioned film, the killer has to go home and process the films of his murders. And this takes time. Time for people to interrupt and display their suspicions at his behavior. But with Powell's film nearly coinciding with the dawn of video, and perhaps the dawning of a different understanding of time, I wonder about a narrative shift brought about by a change in format. <coughs> Nine years after the release of this film came the release of the Sony AV3400 Portapack video camera. As previously described, early manifestations of video equipment such as the Portapack were modular, with camera recorder, monitor, and microphone working as separate components that only came into dialogue through connecting cables. Relative to the uh, singular unit of the JVC GRC1, it's an example of a camera where at least the equipment is still distinguishable. Camera, recording deck, transformer. In terms of a split, a division of labor, 
or perhaps even a division of psyche. But the question I'm interested in is how would the peeping Tom function using such a camera? Or rather, how would the narrative of Powell's film function? In the context of this question, images advertising this equipment seem even more ludicrous than on first glance. The recording unit slung over the shoulder weighs nine kilograms. Fucking hell. In the, in the first instance, the gentleman perched on the tree branch wielding an AV3400 would no doubt have a heightened sense of the nine kilogram recording unit slung over his shoulder. Onto the second image. Um, this one is not of an AV3400, but of a similarly compartmented configuration. The ghosted image of the woman suggests a speed and futurism akin to a Boccioni painting. But of course, nobody could move as quickly as such an image suggests with a camera this heavy. It certainly would have slowed down the forward charge of the main protagonist in Peeping Tom, no matter how voracious the gaze. But in using video instead of film, the time we would have to wait for the images would be no time at all. Hence, a good deal of the movie's narrative tension would be lost with such a shift to relatively instantaneous media. So here, the weight of the camera precludes the possibility of murder, whereas the wait for the image would be no time at all. Now, it's because of its age, it's doubtful that this uh, video player camera will ever be fully functional again. So I'll show you quickly an example of a piece of video that was actually made on a Sony AV3400, just to give you a, a sense of the, of the visual flavor. So the sort of images associated with early Sony portaback cameras are, to my eyes, characterized by a certain ghostliness a blurred, dreamlike black and whiteness somewhere between a Chaplin film and a surveillance camera. And in terms of the location implied, let's say any number of American artist studio spaces in the early to mid-1970s. Now, interestingly, uh, William Wegman, the uh, artist who produced these images, claimed that his subsequent shift from using a Sony AV3400 <laughs> Oh, I know what that was. <laughs> Let me just... I know what that was. That's the sound cable from the uh, computer. I'm sorry about that. That's, I just sort of inadvertently pulled... If I put it back in, it's going to make the same noise. So just put your fingers in your ears and... Uh... Oh, no. That's OK. I think that's OK. We'll, 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 we'll see. We'll see. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, where the fuck was I? Um, yes, interestingly, uh, Wegman claimed that his subsequent shift from using a Sony AV3400 to using um, Panasonic video equipment um, in the mid-1970s coincided with a darker more obtuse turn in his work. One may speculate about this as a conscious artistic decision or something seemingly stemming from the Panasonic brand, a darkness from within the equipment itself that will infuse whatever it records. This implies a breaking down of constituent parts. Now, a phrase such as breaking down perhaps takes us into a realm of destructive behavior. You may have a breaking down of things materially, of things being methodically taken apart and returned 
to a prior form. I sometimes imagine the interior of a camera as being entirely a hollow space, dark, pitch black. But it's not that this would be a darkened space, it's rather there is nothing to see and no way of seeing it. But in truth, one finds oneself staring at the overdetermined network of soldered buttons and multicolored wires with no way to articulate what this might mean. A brief exploration of branding may be in order here. For we're not just speaking of a camera, a Sony, Panasonic, or otherwise, but also a tape that holds the images, which of course may originate from an entirely different manufacturer. The variety of permutations between both introduces another variable to our reception of the signal. So in the UK during the mid-1980s, there was an advertisement campaign for blank media that tied the notion of immortality of memory to the imagery of death. The protagonist was what can only be described as a form of living memento mori. Not a grim reaper so much, but rather a suave skeleton living in a well-appointed apartment. In the TV version of these advertisements, the skeleton was animate and vocal. Placing a video cassette in a player, he would sing stroke rap to me about how this particular manufacturer's tape meant that your images, and by extension, your memories, would never fade. I'm going to show you how it's going to be. With Scotch's lifetime guarantee, take what you want both night and day, then re-record, not fade away. Re-record, not fade away. Re-record, not fade away. Every recording as good as the first, or we'll give you a new tape. You can watch Scotch forever. Re-record, not fade away. Re-record, not fade away. Re Here we return to the logic of the canine camera, with one memory erasing another, and 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 another, until one day the tape fails to erase, leaving us with one constant and singular memory that refuses coexistence with any other memories. When we lose the ability to re-record, perhaps the fear is not the fading away, but rather that we will be doomed to carry only one memory, that like it or not, we will never be able to forget. So, the earlier iterations of the Scotch brand of videotape are, from this perspective, telling. This label is from a cartridge of open reel Scotch videotape of uncertain provenance other than the fact that it came bundled with my used AV Sony 3 400. But rather than a skeleton, here we see a bearskin-hatted guardsman. I presume the pun is intended. Scotch tape, Scots guard, perhaps. The tartan design emblazoned on the label would further suggest such a connection. I initially imagined that this rifle-toting soldier symbolised the protection of one's memories from theft or erasure. But then it occurred to me, what if the guard was there to protect one's memories from oneself? In terms of all these cameras, you're only... If you want to keep with the clunky metaphors, anthropomorphic metaphors, we're only dealing with a form of sort of partial sentience. Um, this unit cannot record, this unit cannot hold images. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed with all of these cameras, even the ones that weren't fully functioning, the one thing that always would seem to work 
would be the viewfinder. This is the principle of what has been described as the, uh, the analog hole. So this really means that once um, information um, is manifest in human perceptible or analog form, images may easily be captured and distributed. in unrestricted form. The notion of the analog whole is usually raised in discussions relating to circumventing restrictions on copyright digitally distributed work, such as the practice of using concealed video cameras to illegally record films in cinemas for bootleg DVD distribution. For those of us who wish to limit the free transfer of images, the analog whole represents a systemic vulnerability but for those of us who wish to revel in the outmoded, this may mean something completely different.
then it, then it started to occur to me that all materials are displaced, recorded or not, that all forms are adulterated in the wrong place at the wrong time in an increasingly unnatural order. Everything is out of its place. Everything is out of its time. In this frame of mind, returning all materials to a place of origin becomes an imperative. This also implies a breaking down of constituent parts. Do you remember the room, the white room? In describing the room, I forgot to ask, do I still have a body? If so, am I clothed? Does the floor beneath, beneath me feel like anything? Is it soft or hard? Or do I find myself floating above the surface with no sense of touch or contact? Thank you.